Yep. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we have some that are going to be watching this remotely, and uh, hopefully some more participants will join in as we go along. Um, the Community of Practice webinar series is sponsored by the I3 Investing in Innovation uh, Federal Grant, and we want to make sure that we're effectively working together in a webinar. Um, for more information about this particular webinar or any of the other we webinars, go ahead and visit and join the Community of Practice. This is a Community of Practice web event. When we look at the work that we're going to be doing today, we're talking about problem-based learning and teaching strategies or organizational strategies to teach the inquiring mind through problem-based learning. One of the things that we find happens quite frequently in problem-based learning is that either people don't know how to start or they don't know how to have their structures and strategies meet the demands of problem-based learning because it, it is a different way of thinking and it does, um, it does involve a whole lot more uh, preliminary work uh, to be able to be successful in a problem-based learning environment. So there are three things that we generally go to. One is the reason for doing it is to empower students so that they can can work and be successful beyond graduation. I, I'm famous for saying around uh, Central Ohio is that we're trying to make sure that every student that exits our systems is economically viable for their own future, meaning that they can enter into a job market, enter into a career, enter into college and then a career and be successful in that, in that environment for their lifetime, for the duration of their lifetime. So these kinds of practices are targeted to empower students to be able to be sustainable over time. To connect the teacher, the student, the environment, the universities, to connect people to each other and to ideas so that we can make sure that students aren't working in isolation, but they're working as a part of a community, and this community of practice is an example of that. And then to advance. So in our particular endeavor, we're really working hard to make sure that every single one of Central Ohio's um, students have reached their, go their goals for college and career success. And when we say all, we mean all. So project-based learning, problem-based learning, there's really two ways of looking at it. For those out there who say, oh, we want problem-based learning, problem-based learning means that you're looking at the process and the means of getting an outcome is the primary, uh, primary importance to you. In project-based learning, the outcome or the, what they produce tends to be more important. Either way, they're working on things collaboratively. They have key knowledge, understanding, and skills that are measured for their success. They have a challenging problem or question that is based in the context of the world in which they live. It's not unique to the uh, environment. It is unique to the context, and it is unique to the student. Um, there is sustained inquiry, there's authenticity, there's student voice and choice, there's reflection, there's critique and revision, and there's a public product. So if we step back from all of these things, we're also looking at all of those things that we say are necessary for a really robust work environment, that we want to, that uh, employers want to hire people who have success skills, who can take a, problem, a challenging problem or question and persist to completion of whatever project they're working on, that can sustain their inquiry and not get bored and quit, that can really use the context that they live in to make the features work for that context, to make, make sure that there is voice in every single person and there's efficacy toward the outcomes that can make a difference, that you are reflective and that you can revise and assist others, and that you are not afraid of a public product. So even though these are things, these are characteristics of problem-based or project-based learning, these are also things that are super important for workforce development, for hiring practices, for anyone who wants to be economically viable in their future. When we're talking about key knowledge, uh, understanding skills and, and success skills, here we're looking at the student learning goals and we want to make sure that we're focusing on those goals in a context that is standards-based. 
that is including critical thinking and that really involves a high degree of problem solving and collaboration for students. So what we mean by that is how do we put the soft skills and the hard skills together in order for students to accomplish or produce something? In Ohio, we have Ohio Learner Standards. This is an example of one. Organisms perform a variety of roles as an ecosystem. Populations of organisms can be categorized by how they acquire energy. Food webs can be used to identify the relationships among producers, consumers, and decomposers in an ecosystem. So within that, there's the design and build. There's the demonstrating key scientific knowledge, et cetera. So when we look at what the, what the um, next generation science standards give us, in this case it's an Ohio standard, those are the things that we baseline our information for. And here's a key. When we're choosing what to do for a project, when I, for me as a principal, helping my teachers, I always ask them to choose, to really first examine the data of how the students are doing in their class or the preliminary data from what they did last year. So I'll take NWEA map as an example. So in, in the MAP assessment, they're looking at themselves and their progression against all other students who took the measure of academic progress in the country, but they're also measuring growth over time. And so for what I tell my teachers to do is to take a peek at the trend that you see for your students in the last assessment that they took. When you look at trends, look for those areas where there's a large gap meaning that there's the, the students just didn't get it and they didn't grow in that particular area. This is an example of one of them that one of my teachers picked. So once you identified a gap area, then that's where we do our, our projects. That's where we do our problem-based um, learning. We wanna do it in areas where there's a big gap so we can spend the time really working hard on concept mastery, skill mastery, um, presentation of learning. Those things are robust enough to carry a student in their understanding and knowledge that they may have struggled with. So I, do, I don't target my teachers and I don't, I don't suggest that they should go to what's easy to do, but go to those areas where students have, have produced gaps, where students in general, the trend is that they don't have knowledge and skill, and then work hard in those areas because it can only help and assist them. We want to make sure that when they're thinking about what, what area to start with, what, where to start with a project or a problem-based learning environment or opportunity, to make sure that they have clear learning targets, that their lear learning intentions are clear, and that the success criteria is clear. So that means that we take the standards, then we look for the clear learning targets, and then what is the learning intention? What do I want to do with regard to this problem-based um, or this project-based unit? What do I want to do? What are the learning intentions? What are the things that I want to make sure happen for learners? In the, the prior example, this would be where they would be looking at gap closing. When we look at the success criteria, that means that we're knowing what it is that students would have to know and be able to do before they start it. So we, we don't develop rubrics as they go along. We give the rubrics to the students at the beginning, and, and then that way they know what the, what the design constraints are, and they can help themselves to march toward them. So we clarify those things first. The plans then have what are the expectations, what's the level of engagement, what are the explanations that are required, and then what environment are we going to use to set that up. So as we talk, I'll go along, or as we go along, I'll refer to these things a little bit more, but when we're looking at the beginnings and looking at the knowledge and skills that would be developed, we're very, very specific about trying to help students, especially in those large gap areas, so that those large gap areas become smaller. Challenging problem or question is a component of what each problem-based or, or project-based um, learning uh, environment has. When you're trying to make sure that you're framing it in a meaningful way, it has to be interesting to the students developmentally, but it also has to be interesting to students contextually. So when we're looking at the context, we're looking at those things like what are the, who are the big employers in the area? Hmm. It might be in Reynoldsburg, it's uh, one of the big employers is TS Tech. They make the seats for Honda America. So what kinds of things might their parents be doing at work that might be interesting to them and they have a connection to their parents? 
or if robotics is a big component of the way that the that the factory is set up how can we show kids what what a career working with robotics might look like and all of the different on ramps and off ramps so we want to make sure that we're looking at a meaningful problem that has that is contextually rich that there's an answer that there could be that could be made for the students and that there's an appropriate level of challenge for their development so here's an example a fifth grade example a rainforest can be described as a tall dense jungle and are described as the oldest ecosystems on earth these incredible places cover only six percent of the earth's surface yet they contain more than half of the world's plant and animal species the world's rain, rainforests are, are currently disappearing at a rate of 6,000 acres every hour. That's about 4,000 football fields per hour. When these forests are cut down, the plants and animals that live in the forest are destroyed. So the essential question that you want to try to generate is what is the potential impact of deforestation on humans based upon the factors that influence the production and usage of oxygen? So this is just an example of one that we did in the fifth grade in, in the school where I was a middle school principal. This is an example of one that they designed for students based on a gap area that they had in their instructional knowledge. Remember, here we're trying to produce investigators. So this was something, this one was something that um, we had a hook for. We had um, it just so happened that we had a park that was closed and it became part of an on-ramp uh, in the area uh, for the highway and there was an outcry about it and what happens to you know the all the plant and animal species that were in this area and the kids were really interested in it so we had a hook that we could use to help them to be able to be super interested in it the second thing that occurred when this particular um, example was formulated is that we had a huge um, high school global climate summit and that global climate summit was the same year as this particular um, problem-based learning opportunity was made for students so they were looking at the high school kids the high school kids were then able to be mentors to the students as they were working on things so this had a huge tie-in to the older kids and the older kids who were working on that particular project and ended up being a, a TEDx when they were working on that they were more than happy to help the students on something that they were working on and this was the fifth grade example so producing investigators is not just what it is that they produce when they're in the classroom but it's also who they work with how do we produce investigators for their peer mentors or their near peer mentors? How do we work with students to be able to cycle themselves through persistence? So noticing things and wondering about things and developing theories and noticing some more and confirming or revising and teaching. So these are all components of what we want to make sure that we produce when we do problem-based learning. So based on the information that you saw before, after researching informational te texts on how plants use and produce oxygen, conduct an experiment on a scientific factor that influences that usage. Write a scientific research paper in which you discuss your background research, experimental methodology, data analysis with results, and argue how a specific factor influences oxygen production and usage. This is a component of the problem-based unit that was described earlier in every single one of ours we had a, a writing task and this happens to be an informational text sometimes it's an argumentative te text and sometimes it's an art it's a narrative text but every single time we made sure that there was a teaching task that included a pretty robust view of writing and in this case the fifth graders were working on research and research paper writing The next part of, of problem-based learning that you need to really consider and, and to set up is the authenticity. And authenticity is also about creative confidence. And so we wanna make sure that we have creative confidence in everything that we build creative confidence in everything that we do, but that we also build it in our teachers. 
Um, I'm going to play a little bit of an of David Kelly, who is the CEO of IDEO and one of the founders of the D School at Stanford for Design. So I'm going to play that now. So I apologize for that uh, sound. I'm not sure what caused that, so I'm not playing the David Kelly, um, but I will send it out so that you can you can look at it. What David Kelly talks about is the capacity for each person to be able to um, know themselves and know how to be creatively confident. And it talks about how there are things that we do that promote it in every single instance. So design thinking is something is a, a, a component of authentic, uh, authenticity and creative confidence that we need to include. I wanted to talk to you today about creative confidence. I'm going to start way back in the third grade at Oakdale School in Barberton, Ohio. I remember one day my best friend Brian was working on a project. He was making a horse out of the clay that our teacher kept under the sink. And at one point, one of the girls that was sitting at his table, seeing what he was doing, leaned over and said to him, that's terrible, that doesn't look anything like a horse. Right? And Brian's shoulders sank, and he wadded up the clay horse and he threw it back in the bin. I kind of never saw Brian do a project like that uh, ever again. And I wonder how often that happens, you know? It seems like when I tell that story of Brian to my class, you see, a lot of them want to come up after class and tell me about their similar experience, how a teacher shut them down or how a student was particularly cruel to them. And they some kind of opt out of thinking of themselves as creative at that point. Right? And I see that opting out that happens in childhood, and it moves in and becomes more ingrained even by the time you get to adult life. So we see a lot of this. You know? When we have a workshop or we have clients in to work with us side by side, eventually we get to the point in the process that's kind of fuzzy or unconventional. And eventually these big shot executives whip out their blackberries and they say they have to make really important phone calls and they head for the exits. And they're just so uncomfortable. When we track them down and ask them what's going on, they say something like, I'm just not the creative type. But we know that's not true. If they stick with the process, if they stick with it, they end up doing amazing things. And they surprise themselves just how innovative they and their teams really are. So I've been looking at this kind of fear of judgment that, that we have, you know, that you don't do things, you're afraid you're going to be judged. If you don't, you know, say the, the right creative thing, you're going to be judged. And I had a major breakthrough when I met the psychologist, Albert Bandura. I don't know if you know Albert Bandura. But if you go to Wikipedia, it says that he's the fourth most important psychologist in history. You know, like Freud, Skinner, somebody in Bandura. Bandura is 86, and he still works at Stanford. He's, a, he's just a lovely guy. And so I went to see him because he's just worked on phobias for a long time, which, which I'm very interested in. He had developed this, this way, uh, this kind of 
um, methodology that it ended up curing people in a very short amount of time. Like in four hours, you had a huge cure rate of people who had phobias. And we talked about snakes. I don't know why we talked about snakes. We talked about snakes and fear of snakes as a phobia. And he, it was really enjoyable, really uh, interesting. He told me um, that he'd invite this, uh, the test subject in, and he'd say, you know, there's a snake in the next room and we're going to go in there. And to which he reported that most of them replied, hell no, I'm not going in there. If there's a, certainly if there's a snake in there. That Bandura has a kind of a step-by-step -step process that was super successful. So he'd take people to this like two-way mirror looking into the room where the snake was. And he'd get them comfortable with that. And then through a series of steps, he'd move, uh, move them and they'd be standing in the doorway with the door open and they'd be looking in there and he'd get them comfortable with that. And then many more steps later, kind of baby steps, they'd be in the room, they'd have like a leather glove, like a welder's glove on, and they'd eventually touch the snake. And when they touched the snake, everything was fine. They were cured. In fact, everything was better than fine. These people who had lifelong fears of snakes were saying things like, look how beautiful that snake is. And they were holding it in, they were holding it in their laps. Right? Bandura calls this process guided mastery. I love that term, guided mastery. Right? And something else happened. These people who went through the process and touched the snake ended up having less anxiety about other things in their lives. Right? They tried harder, they pers persevered longer, and they were more resilient to, in the face of failure, right? They just gained a new confidence. And Bandura calls that confidence self-efficacy, right? The sense that you can change the world and that you can attain what you set out to do. Well, meeting Bandura was really cathartic for me because I realized that this, you know, famous scientist had documented and scientifically validated uh, something that we've seen happen over, you know, for the last 30 years, that we could take people who had the fear that they weren't creative and we could take them through a series of steps, kind of like a series of small successes, and they turned kind of fear into familiarity, and they surprised themselves. The transformation is amazing. We see at the D school now all the time, people from all different kinds of disciplines, they think of themselves as only analytical. And they come in and they go through the process, our process, they build confidence, and now they think of themselves differently. And they're, total, they're totally emotionally um, excited about the fact that they walk around thinking of themselves as a creative person. Right. So I thought one of the things I'd do today is take you through like, and show you what this journey looks like. To me, that journey looks like Doug Dietz. Doug Dietz is a technical person. He designs medical imaging equipment, large medical imaging equipment. He's worked for GE and he's had a fantastic career, but at one point he had a moment of crisis. He was in the hospital looking at one of his MRI machines in use when he saw a young family and his little girl. And that little girl was crying and was terrified. And Doug was really disappointed to learn that nearly 80% of the pediatric patients in this hospital had to be sedated in order to deal with this MRI machine. Right? And this was really disappointing to Doug because at, before this time, he was proud of what he did. You know, he was saving lives with this machine. But it really hurt him to see the fear that this machine caused in kids. About that time, he was at the D school at Stanford taking classes. He was learning about our process, about design thinking, about empathy, about iterative prototyping. And he would take this new knowledge and do something stride, quite extraordinary. He would redesign the entire experience of being scanned. And this is what he came up with. He turned it into an adventure for the kids. He painted the walls and he painted the machine and he got the operators retrained by people who know kids like, you know, children's museum people. And now so when the kid comes, it's an experience. And they talk to him about the noise and the movement of the ship. And when they come, they say, okay, you're going to go into the pirate ship, but be very still because we don't want the pirates to find you. Right. And the results were super dramatic. 
right? So from something like 80% of the kids needing to be sedated to something like 10% of the kids need, needing to be sedated. And the hospital and GE were happy too because, because you didn't have to call the anesthesiologist all the time, they could put more kids to the machine in a day. So the quantitative results were great. But Doug's results that he cared about were much more qualitative. He was with one of the mothers waiting for her child to come out of the scan. And when the little girl came out of her scan, she ran up to her mother and said, Mommy, can we come back tomorrow? <laughs> right? And so I've heard Doug tell the story many times of his personal transformation and the breakthrough design that happened from it. But I've never really seen him tell the story of the little girl without a tear in his eye. Doug's story takes place in a hospital. I know a thing or two about hospitals. A few years ago, I felt a lump on the side of my neck. And it was my turn in the MRI machine. It was cancer. It was the bad kind. I was told I had like a 40% chance of survival. So while you're sitting around like uh, with the other patients in your pajamas and everybody's pale and thin, you know, and you're waiting for your turn to get the gamma rays, you think of a lot of things. Most of you think about, am I going to survive? And I thought a lot about what was my daughter's life going to be like without me? But think about other things. I thought a lot about what was I put on earth to do? You know, what was my calling? What should I do? Right? And I was lucky because I had lots of options. We'd been working in health and wellness and K through 12 and the developing world. And so there were lots of projects that I could work on. But I decided and I committed to at this point that the thing I most wanted to do was to help as many people as possible regain the creative confidence they lost along their way. And if I was going to survive, that's what I wanted to do. I, I survived, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I really believe that when people gain this confidence, and we see it all the time at the D School and at IDEO, that they actually start working on the things that are really important in their lives. We see people quit what they're doing and go in new directions. We see them um, come up with more interesting and more, just more ideas so that they can choose. From, from better ideas, and they just make better decisions. So I know at TED you're supposed to have a change the world kind of thing, isn't that? Everybody has a change the world thing. If, it, if, the, if there is one for me, this is it to help this happen. So I hope you'll join me on my quest. You as kind of thought leaders, it would be really great if you didn't let people divide the world into the creatives and the non-creatives, like it's some God-given thing. And to have people realize that they're naturally creative you know, and that those natural people should let their ideas fly. That they should achieve what my Bandura calls uh, self-efficacy, that, that they can, you can do what you set out to do, and that you can reach a place of creative confidence and touch the snake. Thank you. So I, I show the David Kelly creative confidence um, video for a couple reasons. One, we want to make sure that when we're doing problem-based learning or, or project-based learning, that we allow for the exploration. Teachers are afraid. They're afraid they're going to fail. It's not the way I learned. It's not the, the way that I've ever seen anything being done. And they're afraid to fail. So rather than trying and iterating and trying and iterating, they want to have something that's fully baked. I have all the components and I know exactly what it is that I'm going to do, which isn't a bad thing, but I want to, I won't do anything until I have that. So rather than having that big, like massive four week long project that everybody's going to do, how about we build confidence a little over time? Having smaller tasks, having opportunities for, for teachers to be able to show how inquiry can work how a good idea could be taken forward and to become create, creative themselves. That's the trick. How do we encourage creativity in our teachers so that they have the confidence to be able to do project-based learning? How do we have them then model 
the empowerment and efficacy in their kids. That's really what this is about. With creative confidence comes voice and choice. Students making sure that they have some decision making involved in the project, including how they work and what they create. So design thinking enables that to happen. It gives different solutions to fit the classroom to allow students to have a voice. If students are design thinkers, then they know that they're iterating over time for themselves. There's more creative confidence because of that. There's a lot more effective ways to engage students. It, students don't find that they're doing the same thing every day in a rut. There are different ways of knowing my students as a teacher and students knowing each other. And quite frankly, it's more fun. With design thinking for voice and choice, we need to really consider mindset, belief, and faith and reason. Design thinking is a human-centered mindset, meaning that we're going to look at how does it impact us as individuals or us collectively as a group. How are we going to collaborate to get that done? It's optimistic because there's always a solution that's better than the last solution. And it's experimental, meaning that there's always an iteration that can, be, can move forward. So in mindset, we have to, creativity has to be growth. It can't be a fixed mindset or we're not able to iterate. A fixed mindset says it is this way, it will always be this way, versus a growth mindset where you say it's this way today, what are we going to create for tomorrow? It's a belief that, that people can make a difference. You can make a difference as a teacher or a principal, and, a, and the kids can believe in themselves that they can make a difference in the world and it's faith and reason. You have to have faith in, the, in your abilities and in the abilities of others and that the world can be better. That's the optimistic thing. And when things are challenging, we also have to be experimental and reason through what's causing the difficulty. So when we talk about design thinking and voice and choice, anytime a student is in charge of the design thinking process, they are making choices regarding how they want to move forward. And that's a, a central component of every PBL that I've ever used and that I've ever seen. How do design thinking and PBL go together? They go together like a glove in a hand. The design thinking is the way you approach things. PBL is the process that you go through. Here's an example of um, a student who went through design thinking in a PBL at his school. This is a student who struggled with school um, quite a bit, and I hope that it will inspire you. hand if you've heard of 3D printing. Okay. Raise your hand if you have one hand. I win. I have a follow-up question. Those of you who know me, you can't participate because that's just cheating. How many of you noticed I had one hand when I walked out on stage? Okay. I'm just curious. Um, so, yes, I have one hand, and I was actually born that way, which is quite common, and I'm sure you're wondering on how I lost my hand. And that's it, the dinosaur at Myrtle Beach. So growing up with one hand, a lot of people questioned how I was going to accomplish certain tasks, especially little things like tying my shoe, in which I did learn how to do, but in my defense, I learned how to do it in sixth grade. But Velcro is pretty popular of my generation. In the obstacles that I faced as a, as a child and people questioned me, for example, when I was very young, my mom, my first doctor's appointment, uh, the doctor looked to her and told her that this is a two-handed world 
and he questioned how I was going to make it. And I thought that was absurd, and so did she, and I'm glad that she didn't believe that. So when I, growing up and having one hand and having all these experiences, and especially having a great sense of humor about having one hand, I decided to start a blog called Form 5 to express and share my experiences having one hand. And in doing so, at the same time, I just started, I decided to go out on a limb, literally, and try my first prosthetic device. And I went down to Shriners Hospital in Kentucky. And I'm a very honest person, and I'm just, I'm known for saying how it is. I appreciate the opportunity I had at Shriners Hospital, but the process itself was so lengthy, and the end result and the prosthetic that I got, I was so dissatisfied. And I realized that this was not a problem just for me, but it was also a problem in which a community that I'm in called the Limb Difference Community, and I didn't realize this until today, but it's actually Limb Difference Awareness Month. And the Limb, the limb Difference Community is an online community uh, of blogs like myself of Form 5, uh, just sharing and providing support with those with limb differences. And I realized that this is not a problem that I'm facing, but it's also a problem within the community that I'm in. So, just like every problem that I've had in my life, I assess it and then I explore a solution for it. And in some cases, it's a one-handed solution. So, when I realized that this was a problem, I started to explore other options. And at the same time, there was a maker movement going on that involved 3D printing. And I was 15 and a sophomore in high school, and I knew nothing about 3D printing. And I thought it was too expensive, and I definitely didn't think it was an option for the problem I had at hand. But in actuality, our school uh, got a fab lab through a grant provided by MIT, and I was able to spend my sophomore year printing and innovating different types of prosthetics through 3D printing. And the first device I made in October of last year was unfortunately unsuccessful due to me not having enough wrist movement in my arm itself. Um, but I, just like anything else, I let that setback push me one step further. And I went back into the fab lab, and in February of last year, I completed my first 3D printed prosthetic device in which I was actually able to put on, wear, and move. And at that moment, I knew that it was such, that 3D printing is such a life-changing technology that, that can be presented. And I really started to change what I was doing. So when I was in the Fab Lab, I worked with a group called Enable, which is a nonprofit organization that provides these low-cost 3D printed prosthetics. And with working with them, Enable is a really cool system and they use open source. And what that means is all their files are online and you're able to easily download them as long as you have access to a 3D printer. So in the Fab Lab, I collaborated with Enable and I especially, after the first device didn't work, and I went and talked to them and they provided me with the device that I ended up making in February. Even though the Fab Lab provided me with the final product, I uh, knew that there was more that I could do. And I didn't want to stop there. And I knew that I probably should independently get my own equipment. So in April of last year, I started a Kickstarter campaign to raise $2,400 to purchase a 3D printer. And I really wanted to spend my summer mapping out and continue learning more about 3D printing. And on May 17th of last year, which is actually my birthday, I don't know why I'm telling you that, but I just kind of feel like telling you that. It was my birthday, I raised $2,400, and over the course of the summer, I learned how to do more 3D printing, and I created this device, which I think is the most effective device that I've made. And I've actually, before my TED Talk, I was working on a newer device, and I ended up hating it, and I took it apart literally this week and put this one back together. So I'm glad that I have this, because I think this is probably the most effective device. And I'm sure many of you are thinking that I found a solution. The prosthetic I got from Shiner's Hospital wasn't what I wanted, and now I've created something even better. But I don't want to just stop. I want to provide that service for others. And that's really where my blog has formed into something completely different. So instead of my blog I started three years ago that's just me sharing my experiences and all the funny things I did with having one hand and how I went to school and tied my shoe and now I'm driving with one hand, is it's now becoming something where I want to provide the service of this 3D printing technology and creating these prosthetics for others like myself. And the reason why I'm really here today is because a lot of people see change as out of their hands and they don't think that they can make the difference in their lives. And the first, any, anyone can make a difference if they have enough drive and passion to do so. Any, and, and just a view change is not out of your hands. And anyone can make a difference, whether you have one hand or two, 3D printed or not, the power to make a difference is in your hands.
Thank you. So this student started out with one project where he, he printed something on a 3D printer for a science class. He ended up iterating and iterating and iterating for himself a 3D or through 3D printing a prosthetic. Now he's printing them for other people, measuring them, scanning them, making sure that they fit exactly and that they're functional for them. This is what we aspire to do. But we can we can also stop. We can stop and think and move in small ways too. New ideas are all around. For instance, I, I guess many of you like me, when you go to the grocery store or you go to a store and they say, "Can I round up to the nearest dollar for charity?" That was an, that was somebody's idea, and now billions, billions of dollars have been collected as a result of that kind of thinking. Sustained inquiry as a component of this. Grit, resilience, and persistence are three things that are going to determine whether or not a student can make it or not make it in many environments. If we can't persist to the end of, of a difficult task, we might not be employed there later. If we don't have the grit to try something hard, we may never be satisfied with what it is that we do. If we aren't resilient when things fail, then we sometimes don't learn the next thing. We stop. If Aaron had stopped, then he wouldn't have had the prosthetic that he has now, nor would he have had the initiative to try to help others. So we want to make sure that we have sustained inquiry. So I'm going to define the inquiry continuum within the project-based world. So demonstration is where, so demo or demonstration is where the question is held by the teacher, posed by the teacher. The procedure is also proposed by the teacher and the results are determined by the teacher. So demonstration is, a, is an example where the students aren't actually doing the project, they are seeing the project being done. So if we're talking about robotics and we show them a video about robotics, that's a demonstration. Even if we tell them all the pieces and parts and the results, it's still a demonstration and the teacher is in control. And generally that's, that's a, de a demonstration, maybe a component, like we have to show somebody something real quick, but it's not what we would call a PBL. Structured inquiry, inquiry is where the teacher poses a question, like the question that, you, that I read earlier for fifth grade. The teacher determines what the procedure should be, but the outcomes vary according to the learner. So different learners could get different results. An exam, this is a PBL structure for inquiry, and an example for this would be a research paper that I, that I described earlier. So the teacher posed the question, and the teacher gave them the procedure for how to, how to conduct the research and then produce the paper. But it was varied because the, t the students got to pick the areas of interest for them and what direction they were going to take with regard to the oxygenation. So the students would take different positions and, and write differently. The results would be different because they have a, 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 the ability to choose. So this is where voice and choice would come in on a structured inquiry in what they produce. In a guided inquiry, the teacher poses the question, but the procedure is determined by the learner. So in this case, the teacher would say, hey, let's study, um, and in this case it was, let's, let's create a tool or a device that we can use, the, one, the first one that Aaron did, let's create a tool or device that we can use to hold the markers on the dry erase board and we're, we'll use 3D printing technology to create the prototype. So that was his first endeavor. The teacher said this is what we're going to do. The learners decided how to do it and the learners had varying results. So in this case, a guided inquiry, the teacher poses the question, but the learner and, the learner and their friends um, create the procedures and the results, and they could be different from person to person or group to group. In an open inquiry, the learner determines the question, 
the procedures and the results. Aaron's work with his prosthetic arm was an open inquiry. His inquiry was determined by him. It was his own individual project. The procedure was determined by him and the results were determined by him. So in open inquiry, when the habits of learning in PBL have been established are how we get to entrepreneurship, how we get to the creativity, and the creative confidence that would enable people to move forward, even in an unfamiliar practice. So the goals of a demonstration would be to introduce things or, pro or promote a common path for repeated performance. This is limited and is generally a component of a PBL if it's done at all. In a structured inquiry, your goal would be to introduce concepts, vocabulary, skills, and investigation methods and guide students toward specific discoveries. It provides a common base of experiences. For a guided inquiry, it gives that individual voice and choice, that authenticity, and a sense of accomplishment. It challenges conceptual understanding by allowing people to move to new situations and it develops deeper and broader understanding through real world applications. The goals of open inquiry are to generate questions, encourage students to work together without direct teacher instruction, and to develop and identify concepts, process skills, and raise questions and problems. This is engagement squared. Now I'm gonna deviate a little bit from, the power, from this particular PowerPoint and show you another one or another slide on another one that might be helpful for you. When we're looking at um, what happens inside of an inquiry, we're looking at the knowledge that students have to, have to use in order to produce something, and then the application about how predictable something is. If you look at, if you look at the vertical axis, awareness, understanding, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation, that's the way that the student approaches the thinking that's required for whatever the problem is that you give them. If you look across the bottom, you're looking, you're looking from a known or familiar one and two, so I know it, I can apply it in the discipline, to I can apply it across disciplines in real world predictable situations and in unpredictable situations. So when you look at the rigor relevance framework, when you look at that, you're looking at trying to progress the students to D, the D quadrant. Applying to real world predictable and unpredictable situations and analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. So when we look at inquiry, when we look at inquiry, under A, we would be looking at demonstration, knowledge, awareness, understanding, maybe a beginning of application. But it's low level of application and low level of um, thinking required. When we look at a structured inquiry, we may not have all of the higher order thinking skills, but we are looking at applying across disciplines in real world predictable and unpredictable situations. So that would be a quadrant B example. When we talk about um, a guided inquiry, depending upon the thinking, it could be, it could be A, B, or C. But when we're talking about open inquiry, we're definitely in the D range. So it's always good to think about things in terms of who's going to do what and who's carrying the load. My principal a long time ago used to say, why is it that when I go out to do bus duty, the kids are, are skipping out with light backpacks and a, a light heart. And then I see the teachers coming out with bags and bags and bags of stuff, all beat down, bent over, and sludging through to get to their cars. 
He said, we shouldn't be that way. His name was Dan Hoffman. It shouldn't be that way. We should all be skipping, everyone, students and, and, and kids or parents and um, teachers alike. We should all be happy with the deep thought that we had to do. We should all be working hard, not just a few of us, meaning the teachers at that time. There, some people will talk about how do we do project-based learning if we're a blended environment. The same, the same constructs would work in a blended environment as it does in a regular environment. You're still looking at the essential categories of mindset, quality, skills, adaptive, and te technical skills. We're still looking at the same target. We want to make sure that in like in blended learning, that the teacher is less the, sta the sage on the stage and more the coach in the, in the game. We want to make sure that companies, competencies are essential, but we're also working on those um, soft skills of, of urgency and timeliness and um, vision and resources. So we want to make sure that we're working the same way. So when I think of and when I am in environments that are blended, I don't think of it as any different than any other situation. Blended learning works fine with problem-based learning. When we talk about scheduling, um, we want to try to make sure that we're scheduling with flexible blocking systems so that there's enough time. So an example, arranging teams by humanities and math, or humanities or math and science, making sure the structures are built to assure mastery of content and skills and that integration could occur. So for me as a principal scheduling to make sure that PBL went smoothly in my building, I gave people the same, the same planning times. I didn't give them extra planning time because we couldn't afford it in our particular situation. Um, but we, we did make sure that they were in concert with one another. So if we were arranging by humanities, then the English and social studies teachers had the same planning time with each other for the same grade level. And the math and science teachers had the same planning time at the, for, their, for their particular content for shared students. So it was me making sure as a principal that I'm allowed for the flexibility um, from the planning standpoint, but also that I allow for the flexibility from a, um, a performance standpoint. So that this, the, I put back to back, for instance, um, the algebra two teacher and the chemistry teacher would have the same kids and they'd flip back and forth. Or the English language arts and the eighth grade, or eighth grade English language arts and the eighth grade social studies teachers had their kids back to back so that they could flip back and forth. Or if somebody needed two blocks to do something, then they took all the kids for two blocks and had assistance from the other teacher or vice versa. Um, so it allowed them to be able to have a little bit more flexibility and it was autonomous to the teacher. It wasn't something that I was directing. It was something that they had available to them and that they could choose to do at any given time. Voice and choice aren't important just for students. It's also important for our instructional staff. Professional development is another area or criteria that people often question. We didn't have a lot of money for PD and so rather than going out and finding a bunch of expertise outside to bring it in, I had study groups. I had professional learning community opportunities for people to talk and work together as we investigated and taught each other, taught ourselves the kinds of things that we, that we needed to know and be able to do. Um, so we didn't have a lot of money to send people to multiple states, California or New York or fun places to go, but we did have enough that we could spend time together and investigate. So for, as a principal, I had to really, truly, I had to become an expert on PBL. I couldn't rely on the teachers alone to carry it, and I had to be able to help and assist. It also helped me to calm down questions about evaluation and fears about um, testing. So if I'm good at it and I know it and I can help my teachers to do it better, then I'm better able to make sure that it happens in a way that promotes student growth and development. So the research, I, we went, we've been over all of the research-based strategies that have a high degree, degree of impact on student learning from, from Hattie. We've talked about the gold standard for PBL and we've talked about some of the strategies that are necessary for us to be able to promote 
optimization of problem-based learning. I didn't go into a lot of detail into problem-based learning itself, and I can do that in future webcasts. My name is Marcy Raymond. Um, I'm going to send this particular um, PowerPoint to everybody and give you my um, contact information and email. And then if you have questions or would like more information, I'd be happy to help and assist you as a member of this community of practice. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and I will um, be sure to send the information to you and answer or assist you in any way you might need. Have a great rest of the day, and I hope that if you are working with your teachers or if you are a teacher yourself, that you know how much of an impact you have on every single student. Thank you for the time, with, the time together, and I look forward to speaking with you in the future.